And for some reason, as she was walking, this is what Emmett did. That skittles happened. I wanted people to hear this story, the true story of Till, the way it happened. No matter if you knew nothing about the South, suddenly you knew that was wrong. And you would say, my God, that child treated that way, brutalized that way. How can she confess to God Almighty if she can't come out and tell what happened? Before you can have reconciliation, you have to have truth. Tonight, a look at a defining moment in our nation's shared and often troubled history. One that began in the Mississippi Delta 60 years ago with a death here at the Black Bayou. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joey Chen. The Delta has always held its secrets close in the shadows of its cedars. You can almost hear the whispers of what happened back in the day. But the truth of a young black man's reckless mistake and the horrific penalty he paid for it remained trapped in the heat of a Mississippi night. If these walls could talk, would they scream in terror? Or cry out in desperation? Or would they just fall silent in fear? These are the last walls Emmett Till saw in the barn down on the old Sheridan Plantation, a place that still echoes with the horror of a hot August night. Where a kid from Chicago found himself facing the most brutal type of backwoods justice. His family called him Bobo, 14 years old, husky with a bit of a stutter. He'd begged his single mom to let him come to Mississippi in the summer of 1955 to visit his country cousins. First day, he talked about Chicago. Oh, he told me some stuff you probably didn't know about. Riverview Park. Have you ever been there? Oh. Now, you got to imagine me in the cotton fields listening to a story about an amusement park that lodged. I just couldn't believe that. Emmett was a storyteller and a jokester. But for all his street smarts, Simeon Wright found his older cousin could be naive. Emmett didn't know there were certain things he couldn't say and couldn't do. No, I don't think so. He didn't know anything about the mores of the South. We didn't. We lived here. We didn't know. We didn't know about lynching. In the Jim Crow South, African Americans were under attack. In Mississippi alone, more than 500 lynchings were documented between the late 1800s and 1955, the year Emmett Till and his cousins took a ride down to Bryant's grocery store. Now this is the part of the story everyone thinks they know. But Simeon Wright was actually with Emmett Till when Carolyn, the young wife of store owner Roy Bryant, stepped outside. And she was going to a car for something. We don't know what. And where were you? Standing right beside Emmett, the, outside the door there. And, and that's when you heard him whistle? Yeah. And oh my goodness. The boys had gone down to the store at the crossroads known as Money, Mississippi, just for some candy and pop. Over the years, history has clouded over what happened inside the shop whether Emmett really did try to flirt with Carolyn Bryant. But Simeon Wright heard his cousin whistle at the young woman. That scared us half to death. Why? Oh, my goodness. Whistling at a white woman in Mississippi? Oh. No, it's better to play with a rattlesnake. What'd you tell him? We didn't have time to tell him anything. I, he saw our re reaction, it scared him. We ran to the car, we got out of town as fast as we could. Did you know there was going to be trouble after? I figured if we had gotten caught, you know, they had caught a whip that night, they would have whipped us. But murder never crossed my mind. Never thought that he would be killed for that. The boys bailed out of their car and ran into the fields to hide. But trouble didn't follow that day 
or for three days after. By Saturday, the boys had all but forgotten their fear until late in the night when pounding at the door woke them from a sound sleep. And when I opened my eyes, I saw two white men standing at the foot of my bed. Uh, I recognized one, Roy Bryant, the husband to Callum Bryant, but the big guy, the bully, well, the guy with the gun, Milam. He ordered me to lay back down and he made Emmett get up and put his clothes on. Then my mother came in there. She began to beg and plead with them. He offered them money and... She offered them money? Yes, to leave him alone. Roy Bryant hesitated. Uh, J.W. Myler, he didn't. He, money wasn't going to be enough. Money, money wasn't going to stop him. The men took Emmett away down Dark Fear Road. What were you thinking? Your cousin was taken from right next to you. Well, they said they were going to bring him back. So I laid there in shock all night. Every car that would come by, I hear that sound. They're bringing him back. But when the sun came up, I knew then that they wasn't going to bring him back. They took him here to this barn on a farm so far out in the country, few could have heard the boy's screams. But there were witnesses. You were just a little boy. Very much so. On the night of the murder, the storekeeper's half-brother, J.W. Milam, came to Johnny Thomas's house looking for help. The story says that uh, there were African-Americans uh, under the arrest involved. My name is Henry Loggins. My father was Henry Lee Loggins. And, and he was Milam's right-hand man. He was Milam's person that took care of all of his mechanical equipment. Can't figure out why would they had me involved and I know nothing about it. For many years, people said that your father was involved. Yeah, and of course he said uh, he don't know why they say he was involved. But you had your doubts. Of course, he would have no choice but to do exactly what J.W. told him to do or to participate in. Do you feel guilty? I don't feel guilty, but I feel involved. I feel involved because of my father. Why would a black man help these white murderers come and take Emmett? Everything based on fear. If you, can, if you can instill fear in the hearts of a group of people, you can control them. It was a lesson well understood in the Mississippi Delta of the 1950s, where an all-white, all-male jury quickly acquitted Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam of murder, and a grand jury refused to even indict them for kidnapping. Months later, Emmett Till's killers justified the torture and murder of the boy in a National Magazine article that would frame the story for years to come. J.W. Milam told Look Magazine he only intended to scare the boy, saying, quote, well, what else could we do? He was hopeless. I'm no bully. I never hurt a nigger in my life. I like niggers in their place. I know how to work them. But I just decided it was time a few people got put on notice when a nigger gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living, and I'm likely to kill him. Milam gave a detailed confession, explaining that after hours of pistol whipping him, he'd ordered the boy to strip naked, shot him, then dumped him into the Tallahatchie River with an industrial fan barbed wired around his neck to hold the body down. Three days later, some kids out fishing saw Emmett's feet sticking out of the water. What reminds you of him now? What reminds you of that summer? Smell of the honeysuckle. Whenever I smell that, I, it takes me back to 1955. Or a car down the street like this. Because I laid in that bed that night waiting for them to bring Emmett back. A memory on a Mississippi breeze at the end of a lonesome country road. In a moment, after the killers so boldly confessed their roles, why wasn't anyone ever held accountable for Emmett Till's death? The answer when we return. And later, courage in the face of terror. 
Emmett Till's mother, her brave choice, and why it was almost left forgotten in the junk pile of history. What took place here at the Black Bayou 60 years ago, a horror story, a cautionary tale, a lynching so terrifying it became the grist of the talk generations of African-American parents have given their own sons is also to this day an unsolved crime. No one was ever convicted, and almost all of those who might have had a hand in it have since gone to their own graves, silent about the murder of Emmett Till and about the racial injustice that killed him. If you had any doubt that hate still dwells on the banks of the Tallahatchie River, you need only look to the sign. The memorial that commemorates Emma Till's end here on a hot August night, pierced by the anonymous reminders that evil was allowed to go free. We know there's people out there who were never in support of seeing justice done with, uh, for Till, but who actually hold this animosity and this hatred um, you know, of white supremacy. It's a hatred never forgotten by the African-American sons raised in the shadow of Emmett Till's life and his death. My first introduction to the Emmett Till case um, came when I was 10 years old. I was in my parents' study and I came across a Jet magazine photograph of Till. And I have to say, like many of us who saw this photograph for the first time, it shocked me and I just needed to know what this picture was. So my parents came in and explained the story to me. When I was in high school, I, I can remember interracially dating, and my parents would tell me before I left the house at night, don't let what happened to Emmett Till happen to you. Born more than 15 years after Till was lynched, filmmaker Keith Beauchamp could never shake the image of the boy's mutilated body or his outrage that no one was ever held accountable, even though the two prime suspects confessed after they were acquitted at trial. After the trial in 1955, four months after, Roy Bryan and J.W. Milam confessed to the murder of Emmett Till to a reporter by the name of William Bradford Huey for $4,000. They were never brought up on charges um, because of the fact of the double jeopardy rule. They could not be tried in the court of law for the same thing twice. So they got off scot-free. Beauchamp was determined to see justice done for Emmett Till, even if he had to do it himself. I decided to go back to the Delta and dig up for more information. Uh, I could hear people outside talking, and uh, they're talking about Emmett. For nine years, Beauchamp interviewed eyewitnesses. Things just really got out of hand. That was his story, but we know better. And poured over thousands of pages of old documents. He identified at least 14 people he believes were involved in the kidnapping and murder. And he came to the grim conclusion that at least five of them were African American. And they had all these names. So that was some of the things that I actually presented to um, the U.S. Justice Department. We were able to find a few things that, you know, were not found in the 50s. Dale Killinger was the FBI agent assigned to the case when it was reopened in 2004. Milam and Bryant had help. Following up on Beauchamp's leads, the investigator learned new details. At the time of Emmett Till's death, I was 13 years old. From witnesses who had been afraid to come forward in 1955. And, in, uh... and when Till's body was exhumed, he was able to put to rest the legend some locals told that the lynching was a hoax. In 55, they alleged the NAACP had placed a different child's body in the river and it wasn't Emmett Till and there were rumors that he was seen in other cities. We were able to say definitively that it was Emmett Till and that he was murdered by gunshot um, to the head. But the investigation didn't turn up enough proof against two people at the center of the case who were still alive. The shopkeeper's wife Emmett had whistled at, Carolyn Bryant, and the black worker who'd been the right-hand man of Bryant's brother-in-law, the alleged killer. The ultimate finding by the grand jury was a no true bill, which is no indictment, 
um, on charges against Carolyn Bryant and uh, Henry Lee Loggins. I felt we had enough to indict, but I also understand history. And when I say history, you have to look at the fact that Carolyn Bryant, if she was ever indicted for the kidnapping and murder of Till, she would have been the first white woman ever indicted for a civil rights murder. I knew it was going to be a challenge to get an indictment. But then you have Henry Lee Loggins, one of the black men who we believe was forced to participate. It would have been a challenge to get him too, because you would have heard from the black community, how can you indict a black man for killing Emmett Till, but you didn't indict any of the whites? Let the church say amen. amen. Get a Lord a hand clap of praise. But there is another amen. path to the amen. true story amen. and a higher justice as well. Lord, we repent today, oh God. Because Pastor Willie Williams is part of an effort to bring the Delta face to face with its sorry history. And you still hear people say, well, why are you guys trying to open up stuff that happened in the past? Why don't y'all let that die? Let... But I think we, you know, we've been silenced too long. Therefore, choose life. The faith-based community, we, I think we need to take the lead in true reconciliation. Williams urges visitors to see the memorials, take historic tours, examine the markers that follow Emmett Till's last days. Even the courthouse where his killers were exonerated. The story is not an easy one, but it has a ready audience. And we have people coming from all over this country and uh, want to know more about this story. That effort is unsettling to the man committed to telling Emmett Till's story himself. I understand what a lot of these folks are doing in the Delta. Many of them want to have reconcile what happened in, in 1955. But before you can have reconciliation, you have to have truth. And if that truth is not out there, which I know it's not out there, then we're doing things backwards. With no one held accountable for the hatred that killed here, Beauchamp fears its whispered history will always haunt the Delta Pines. If new evidence is found, the Emmett Till case could be reopened, but time is running out. Only a few people who could bear witness survive. In a moment, a mother's grief and her courage Mamie Till Mobley's decision to show the world what happened to her son and how it will play a central role in telling the history of black America. Maybe the most extraordinary thing about what took place here in LaFleur County, Mississippi, 60 years ago is just how commonplace it was. Mississippi saw more than 500 lynchings from the end of the Civil War to the mid-1950s. Most often the victims were men, but women and children were too. And so when Emmett Till was taken from his cousin's bed in the dark of the night, his death might have passed unnoticed. Instead, it changed history. Every picture tells a story. This one told the truth. Even in her grief, Mamie Till Mobley wanted to share the hardest, most brutal truth about the torture of her only child. I saw that uh, this eye was out and it was lying about midway the cheek. I looked at this eye and it was gone. I looked at the bridge of his nose and it looked like someone had taken a meat chopper and chopped it. Just try to imagine Mamie Till Mobley's pain. A single mother from Chicago, she'd given in to her son's pleas to spend his summer vacation with his cousins down south. Just one week later, he was taken from his great uncle's house in the dark of the night, tortured and killed. His story could have been lost in the depths of what the locals call the Black Bayou. But Mamie Till fought to bring her son home.
They try to make us bury him here to do away with the evidence. And we had the grave dog. Emmett Till's cousin, Simeon Wright, recalls his aunt's bold decision. She insisted the funeral director in Chicago present her son in an open casket. Mr. Rayner wanted to know, was I going to have the casket opened? I said, oh yes, we're going to open the casket. He said, well, do you want me to do something for the face? Want me to try to fix it up? I said, no, let the people see what I've seen. I said, I want the world to see this. We thought that was a courageous thing to do. I mean, I, she had a lot of critics, but the only thing to do. Now who's going to believe that? Who's going to believe that Emmett was mutilated like that and shot in the head? No one. Decades later, historian Lonnie Bunch met Mamie Till and found all those years later, her conviction remained the same. She wanted the world to see what they did to her baby. And in some ways, part of what made this so powerful was that it was captured by the media, that it was captured by Jet Magazine, then picked up in many other media pieces around the country. It was viral before there was before viral. Before there was viral. And in a way, it became then the symbol that no matter if you knew nothing about the South, suddenly you knew that was wrong. You would say, my God, that child treated that way, brutalized that way, that was wrong. It gave it both national support, but also national visibility. And I think that was the first step in really what we now call as the modern civil rights movement. At the funeral, thousands lined up to pay their respects, but hundreds of thousands more saw the shocking photograph of Emma Till in Jet magazine and were moved to speak out. Mamie Till's decision changed lives. Emmett Till was a cautionary tale. We all learned about Emmett Till. We weren't even sure of his name, maybe, but we all knew about this boy from Chicago that went to the South and was brutally murdered. Nearly three generations later, federal investigators reopened their case and exhumed his remains, which lay in a specially designed casket. It was a traditional casket, but there was a sort of a glass plate over it so that you could look down into it. After the investigation was complete, the remains were returned to Burr Oak Cemetery in a new casket, but the original was left abandoned. The casket was just basically sitting in a corner, um, and it had raccoons in it. And the family was very upset about that. They realized that maybe the casket was of historical note and should be preserved at the Smithsonian. It really as director of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, Lonnie Bunch chose the casket and the boy's story to become a centerpiece of the new museum when it opens next year. The murder of Emmett Till really became one of those moments that pointed America in a new direction. The evidence from the casket also helped investigators clarify some facts. But one witness still alive today has yet to speak publicly about what she knows. The woman Emmett Till whistled at, Carolyn Bryant. On the way down, I was thinking about her. I said, now she have lived to be an old woman. And she hasn't told anybody about what happened. How can she confess to God Almighty if she can't come out and tell what happened? I forgave her in age 24. Does that mean I don't want to see justice? I want to see justice. Wright says that history and a new generation need a full account of what happened in the barn that night and why. As a black man living in Mississippi in 1955, there was no protection under the law, none whatsoever. Wright speaks often to tourists and to young people who sometimes have trouble connecting Emmett Till's story to their own lives. They said that that happened old school, long time ago. History books. Yeah, until Ferguson. Then their eyes began to open. Ferguson is not new. 
um, Eric Gardner is not the first, but that rather there's a long tradition of violence in this country, racial violence, and we have to remember that in order to confront it. I also think that we should look back to maybe maybe Till Mobley because the notion of mobilizing people to affect change is still one of the greatest things we can do in this country. That the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. A young life lost in the darkest days of the Delta, but a legacy never forgotten. I'm Joey Chet. Thanks for joining us.